Hi, it's me, MC of Healthy by George. I come to you every Friday and Sunday. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about genetics and how they influence our health because I really learned a lesson with my hip replacement and my genetic predisposition towards what we call carrying the trait for thalassemia. So think about subscribing. I'd love to see you here every Friday and Sunday, and let's have a conversation about longevity as we get older. How do we stay healthy? How do we stay engaged in our health and our well-being so that we're functioning well into our 80s and 90s? That's my goal, my friends. So join me on this journey and think about subscribing. I'd love to see you here. So genetics. Well, I learned a real lesson during this hip replacement about how my genetics, which was not really well documented in my medical record because it was nothing ever, nothing I ever was tested for. It's something that I knew because of my father's sister having a um, children which had some challenges due to her and her husband both carrying the trait for thalassemia. And that causes this anemia, and it causes sort of this misshapen hemoglobin. There's a reduction. It's misshapen and small. It's small when you compare it to other hemoglobin, normal hemoglobin. And also, too, it, those people who carry the trait, they're anemic. And it's very difficult to increase your, your hemoglobin because iron, taking iron pills doesn't do it. Um, and so all my life I've had low hemoglobin. And I think when I look back in 2017, my hemoglobin wasn't as low as this most recent hip replacement, but it was still low. It was in the sevens, which is still low. And I really believe that's what caused me to have my fracture. And, and this is something that is rare. It's not something that happens, but if you carry the trait for thalassemia, this is a potential risk, even though it doesn't occur very often. So why are genetics important when we think about our health? Well, one of the things is there are many diseases that are also out there because they have a strong influence over diseases, such as cystic fibrosis sickle cell anemia, which is a big one. I know that's a real challenge. Huntington's disease, even though these things don't occur very often, there still is this high genetic determination. If you have a mutation that you might likely inherit the condition. And that's where it's like, how do we know if it's moderate or high or low or, you know, what is the condition and how, how are you going to, everyone's learning about this because truthfully I don't know much about it with my own self. I'm going to be seeing a hematologist so I can learn more about why this happened with my most recent surgery and my hemoglobin plummeted to a six making me uh, having the need for a blood transfusion but that didn't really work. I had two blood transfusions nothing worked. Finally, a drug called alpha epoetin is what helped me gain some uh, hemoglobin increase, but I still feel, here I am almost, not quite three weeks post-surgery, um, I'm still feeling very, very sluggish, and that everything takes me much more time than normal. So why is it there's this issue of genetic risk? Well, apparently, if there are multiple genes that you have you can, that are working together, you might have a high predisposition towards type two, type 2 diabetes or heart disease or some cancers such as breast cancer, like we learn about the BRCA mutation. Some, there's some indication of Alzheimer's disease and these are things where if we understand the genetics, we can understand how this increases our risks and what do we need to do with our environment and our nutrition 
and our motivation to exercise so that we can help reduce that risk so that if we do have see some predisposition of these genetic um, types of conditions that maybe we don't get you know full on or, or, or we catch it early or we do things that we can somehow circumvent the process of, of really developing these conditions. And I think what we can look at is how we can see that this trait issue, such as I carry a trait, um, it plays a role. It's not as powerful, I think, as, as having a, um, a full, uh, I think the traits are when you don't have a full um, genetic expression. Like, you know, one parent didn't have this and the other parent did. So you do have a, a some small genetic precondition for this type of condition. And so those are the situations where when you have a trait, you can look at how your behavior can help you. Your diet, stress, physical activity, all of these are key elements that really can reduce or even modify our potential risk. And, you know, all my life, I've kept my hemoglobin between eight and nine because I do love to eat leafy green vegetables. I'm one of those people who adores eating liver. I know most people don't like it. Um, you know, so I do, I'm very conscious that that's a predisposition. And when I would talk this over with my primary care provider, she felt like I had become accustomed to the low hemoglobin and therefore it really wasn't such a concern. I think as you get older, this is when you start to kind of look into this a little more because I really wanna understand how the genetics really influence me, my, my process versus the issue with regards to the lifestyle factor. So even though you might have a gene expression, which is the kind of like your blueprint or your baseline for risk, sometimes it's lifestyle choices that trigger that to be expressed. While if you're not doing things to trigger it, either in the environment or with your lifestyle choices, that gene may be silent or it may be inconsequential as you get older and that therefore it's kind of turned off or it's, um, you know, they, they definitely make a difference. And this is a process which I love to understand, but it's quite a complicated to understand epigenetics. Epigenetics is sort of like this, um, this element within our cells that pertains to a memory of everything that we've been exposed to. There's a whole field of science called epigenetics, and I'll put a definition down in the show notes, where it expresses or it retains a memory of everything you've been exposed to. So if you've been exposed to cigarette smoke, those cells will show that you were exposed. If you've been exposed to certain drugs, if you've been exposed to certain elements in the environment, all of that shows up in this epigenetic signature in your cells, which is becoming a fascinating element of research where we can understand more and more of how to make things more uh, patient-centered when it comes to care. I'm real excited about how epigenetics is, is being featured in our science. We're still early in the process, but we are definitely making huge gains to understand what exposures in our environment or to nutrition or to chemicals or, or whatever changes or triggers certain health issues that we can possibly find out more and have better treatments being individualized because each individual is uniquely exposed to whatever their lifestyle and their environment and their their manner of living has done. It's not like it's intentional, but it's definitely like fascinating to learn how we can be more aware of how our body really takes in the messages 
of our environment. It takes in the messaging of our nutrition. It takes in the messaging of our lifestyle stress. So that's why, you know, seriously, stress plays a much larger role than we ever thought before. So I guess the key takeaways are, you might inherit a predisposition towards a genetic condition, such as mine, thalassemia trait. But your daily habits and what you do in your environment can definitely shape how it might actually show up in your health outcomes. There are definitely things happening in our health sciences to learn more about epigenetics, where we can start to see how are your cells telling us what's going on and we can determine a more personalized treatment to help you with what's happening based on your types of exposures and your types of environmental engagement. And finally, you know, it's about how we choose to interact with our life every day. This is something I think we don't take seriously enough. I know for me, this is something I really want to work more intentionally about is mindset. How can I have the better mindset of wanting the most healthy environment, nutrition, um, sleep habits, exercise habits that will support me in having what is called a functional long living life where I'm enjoying my life until the very day that I die. I want that, you know, I don't want to be someone who is, you know, just severely disabled or weak or I'm losing balance or losing my ability to think clearly. I really want to live as fully as I can, as much as I can, and I think we all want that. But sometimes it feels overwhelming. So think about one thing that you could do this week that you might want to reconsider how you approach it. I know for me, I'm going to be thinking about sleep. Somehow this sleep, my sleep mojo has just disappeared. And so I'm going to be really working hard to make myself feel comfy, have a good environment for my sleep behavior, and work on my sleep for the next month. What are you going to work on for your longevity? How are you going to help your lifestyle choices? decrease your genetic predispositions because we all have them sometimes they're hidden and sometimes they show up like they did with mine in this most recent experience with my hip replacement be well my friend we have this one precious life let's live it to the fullest into our old old years functioning and enjoying ourselves until the day we let go of this body Check me out every Friday and Sunday and think about subscribing. I'd love to see you here. Bye-bye.